Well, welcome to episode three of the series High Plains Drifting. I'm in South Central Wisconsin and currently operating out of the Tactical Operations Center, as you can see, as you used to call it, the talk. So arrived uh, yesterday afternoon, got the command post set up, was able to chopper in the T-bones in the beer and turn this command post into a beach party. And I think it goes without saying, you know how I like my steak. They got me rare, rare but not cold. <laughs> so let's get started with episode three, The Last Buffalo Hunt. God damn it, I want that tree line bombed! Drive one three, we'll fix the fuck with one target. Gonna press the mortar fire off the tree line down there. Roger, here we come. Good, give it all your guns, bring in all your ships. Uh, swing a breath. This is gonna be a big one. On a sweltering August day in 1873, the expanse of southwest Nebraska's high plains, just east of modern-day Trenton, became the stage for one of the most tragic episodes in the annals of the American frontier. What began as a routine buffalo hunt for a group of Pawnee would end in a brutal massacre that would forever alter the course of their history. A white settler would visit the site a few days later and give it the name that endures to this day. Massacre Canyon. On July 3rd, 1873, a group of Pawnees set out from their reservation near Genoa, Nebraska. Led by the seasoned 60-year-old named Sky Chief, the hunting party comprised 250 men, 100 women, and 50 children. Their mission was simple, yet crucial. To supplement their meager crops and uncertain government annuities with the life-sustaining bounty of the buffalo hunt. The Pawnee conducted large-scale buffalo hunts twice a year in the Republican River area. One in the summer, after finishing the planting of their crops, and the other in winter. The prior hunt in December 1872 ended in disaster because Lakota Sioux raiding parties captured over 100 horses and forced the Pawnee to abandon most of their meat and goods and return to the agency on foot. During that time, the Grant administration appointed a new Indian agent for the Pawnee, William Burgess. Like most agents, he was a Quaker, dedicated to having the natives abandon their culture and become civilized. The pillars of making them civilized were education, Christianity, and farming. The Quakers saw no useful purpose in the traditional buffalo hunt. However, Burgess was so shocked by the tribe's poverty that he encouraged the summer hunt. Accompanying the Pawnee was John Williamson, a 22-year-old farmer who Burgess appointed as the official trail agent. Despite his inexperience, Williamson was well-liked by the Pawnee. A trail agent's tasks revolved around providing counsel, assisting in scouting, coordinating with settlers and the army, and ensuring the tribe did not, quote, commit depredations on the settlers, unquote. As the Pawnee hunting party made their way across the plains, storm clouds were gathering on the horizon. Unbeknownst to them, two bands of their sworn enemies, the Lakota, had caught wind of their presence. The Oglala band was led by Little Wound and Pawnee Killer, while Spotted Tail led the Brule. The Lakota warriors were itching for a fight, their blood still boiling from recent losses to Ute horse thieves. Here is where things go from the sublime to the ridiculous. The Oglala trail agent, Antoine Janus, had successfully stopped the Lakota from hunting down the Utes. However, when Little Wound approached him about attacking the Pawnee, Janus was vague enough that Little Wound felt he could do as he wished. The Oglala dispatched runners to Spotted Tail's camp upstream on Stinking Water Creek. The trail agent there, Stephen Estes, tried in vain to prevent them from joining the attack. As a result, on the 4th of August, some 1,000 Lakota warriors began their assembly and movement to attack the Pawnee. That evening, as the Pawnees made camp along the Republican River, Three white buffalo hunters arrived with a dire warning. A large Sioux war party was camped nearby, poised to attack. However, Sky Chief was skeptical and dismissed the warning as a ploy by the hunters to scare them off and claim the buffalo for themselves. In a heated exchange, Sky Chief berated Williamson as a squaw and a coward 
for siding with the White Hunters and recommending caution. The young trail agent, stung by the insult, retorted, I will go as far as you dare go. Don't forget that. These words would haunt him in the days to come. As dawn broke on August 5th, the Pawnee hunters spotted several herds of buffalo and eagerly set off in pursuit, leaving their women, children, and older men to tend to the pack animals. It was then that the true nature of the distant herd they had spotted earlier became horrifyingly clear. The initial Sioux attack came swiftly, with a vanguard of about 100 warriors slamming into the Pawnees, catching many off guard as they began to skin their buffalo kills. Most of the Pawnee men were armed with bows and arrows, with only a few carrying muskets or rifles, leaving them outgunned. Sky Chief, the proud leader who had scoffed at the warnings, fell in this first assault, surrounded and cut down as he desperately tried to reach his horse. As the main Sioux force arrived, the Pawnees found themselves outnumbered and outgunned. However, they insisted on holding their ground, believing they could repel the attack. Williamson, seeing the hopelessness of their position, urged a retreat to a more defensible stand of timber, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. In a desperate attempt to halt the Sioux onslaught, Williamson rode out alone, waving a white handkerchief. His peace overture was met with a hail of bullets, forcing him to flee back to the Pawnee lines on a wounded horse. As the full might of the Sioux force bore down upon them, the Pawnee elders finally ordered a retreat, but it was too late. The withdrawal quickly devolved into a panicked rout, with Sioux warriors lining both sides of the shallow canyon, raining down fire on the fleeing Pawnees. The scene that unfolded was one of unspeakable horror. Women desperately tried to save their children, jettisoning precious supplies in their frantic escape. Williamson, caught up in the chaos, would forever be haunted by the memory of a little Pawnee girl left behind, her arms raised in a silent plea for help as he galloped past, unable to save her. As the survivors reached the Republican River, the Lakota stopped their pursuit and went about the grisly task of finishing off the wounded and enjoying the spoils of battle. Taking advantage of the respite, the Pawnee traveled to the east along the Republican River. At the mouth of Blackwood Creek, Williamson and several Pawnee elders encountered the 49 men of Company B of the 3rd Cavalry under the command of Captain Charles Meinhold. The survivors implored Captain Meinhold to join them to go after the Sioux. Meinhold instead had them continue to move downriver, and he would travel to the battlefield. After the recon of the canyon, Meinhold halted the command for the night. The next day, he marched 20 miles up Frenchman Creek. It appears that Meinhold and his scout, the legendary frontiersman Leon Pallardy, realized that discretion was the better part of valor and returned to provide protection for the Pawnee. When the dust settled, the toll was devastating. 20 Pawnee warriors, 39 women, and 10 children lay dead. Scores more were wounded, and 11 children had been taken captive by the Sioux. The victorious warriors mutilated the bodies of the fallen and set fire to the Pawnee's belongings, creating pyres upon which they threw their victims. Several weeks after the massacre, both trail agents Janus and Estes were able to secure the release of the Pawnee captives. Massacre Canyon marked the beginning of the end for the Pawnee people in Nebraska. Some historians believe that the event made the Pawnee realize that the U.S. government could never adequately protect them. Thus, they reluctantly agreed to leave their ancestral homeland for Indian territory in present-day Oklahoma. In 1925, the citizens of Trenton, Nebraska, held their third annual Massacre Canyon powwow. During the event, both Sioux and Pawnee survivors attended and, for the first time, smoked the peace pipe, albeit reluctantly. The state of Nebraska dedicated the 35-foot-tall monument on September 26, 1930, on a rocky outcrop overlooking the mouth of Massacre Canyon. Due to highway relocation, the state moved the monument to its new site in the late 1950s. Regardless of where the monument is located, the 1873 Massacre Canyon episode exemplifies the intertribal warfare that highlighted the brutal realities of Native American life. The night before I explored Massacre Canyon, a confirmed tornado passed directly over McCook, Nebraska. But thankfully, it never touched down. Taking cover in a ditch two miles south of McCook, 
I captured this footage. I have often contemplated becoming a storm chaser when I retire in a few years. Yes, there's a certain madness to it. There's something deeply primal about a storm, something that calls to the chaos inside us all. And I'd rather die drenched in adrenaline and rain than wither away on some golf course.